Uh, next, we're going to turn to someone uh, whose questions about consciousness may uh, be coming from a different angle. Dr. Patricia Smith Churchland is a Canadian American philosopher. Currently, she is chair of the University of California San Diego Philosophy Department, an adjunct professor at the Salk Institute for Biological Research, and associate of the Computational Neuroscience Laboratory at Salk. She is surrounded by philosophers, as her husband, Paul Churchland, also pleads guilty to that profession. Her recent work focuses on neuroethics, the attempt to understand choice, responsibility, and the basic of moral norms in terms of brain function, brain evolution, and brain culture interactions. Please welcome Dr. Churchland. Sure. Oh, yes, I am wired. Great. Has anybody got any glutamate left? Uh, it's very late in the day, and um, it's been a very, very rich and, and really very wonderful day. Uh, although my brief is to talk about consciousness, I'm actually going to say very little about it. What I would really rather do is um, to sort of take a very broad picture about some of the open questions in neuroscience and just to say a little bit about uh, what we don't know given the background of really the stupendous discoveries that have been made in neuroscience over the last couple of decades. I begin with this particular slide really just to remind ourselves that our brains are as they are because they are the products of natural selection. And as we now know, the conservation of structures is really very remarkable across species. And uh, we, it's unlikely that we are going to find in ourselves structures and even functions that are absolutely unique and have no precursors in other animals. All right. The other point that's useful to make from the background of evolutionary biology is this, that we differ from plants, that is, animals differ from plants, fundamentally in having a nervous system that enables us to move. We don't have to wait and take life as it comes. We can look for food, look for mates, see to it that our offspring are nurtured, and so forth. Motor control, or more broadly perhaps, behavior is really the fundamental thing for which nervous systems are designed. And I think it sometimes is forgotten as we explore uh, the nervous system from its sensory aspects or from the aspects of learning and memory, that whatever those functions are in their nature, they have to be serving behavior and motor control. So that perception is not there for the sheer wonderful beauty of it. It's there only because it serves behavior and motor control in some fundamental way. An organism that has absolutely stupendous color vision, but that, where that color vision in no way informs its behavior is not going to survive and consequently will not pass on its genes. Oh, let me just go back. I'm sorry. Um, it was really Paul McLean who, who put the matter very succinctly. The basic function of nervous systems is to enable a body to move so as to succeed at the four Fs. Feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproduction. And, <laughs> and I think that that does essentially capture uh, the, the important point. Between the sensory neurons on the sensory periphery and the motor neurons on the other end are what, to a first approximation, we can call the interneurons. And the basic function of interneurons is to bring it about that behavior is informed. Part of what the nervous system needs to do is to have increasingly good predictions about what's going to happen in the world. And to the degree, other things being equal, that is motor equipment and so forth, to the degree that an animal has better and better predictions about where food is, who constitutes a good mate, 
what's wrong with this? Will the wasp sting? To that degree, its survival uh, is promoted. Now, much has been asked, especially in the morning session, about nature versus nurture, and do we have a gene for sociability? Do we da da da? And several people that I chatted with over the break um, rather mourned the fact that people are still, um, shall I say, burdened with the idea that there is a fundamental distinction between nature and nurture. So let me just make a couple of obvious points that I'm sure most people here uh, will be familiar with. One of the great things that I think we have learned over the past couple of decades is the distinction as described in the 1970s and 80s was really deeply misconceived. I think it was Sidney Brenner who once said to me something like this, well look, suppose that Mother Nature got to a point where she said, well look, what should I do now? Should I put into the genome synapse by synapse and neuron by neuron how to make a brain? Well, that would be really very difficult. Or should I, as Mother Nature, and wanting to get things done quickly, should I do the following? Should I rely on the fact that there are many regularities that obtain that the genes can take advantage of. So regularities in, for example, chemical milieu of the conceptus and the fetus, or regularities that exist in the post-birth situation. So that the genes can count on the existence of those regularities to turn on other genes which turn on other genes, and then we get gene expression in this wonderful, intricate, regulatory cascade. So it means really that Mother Nature doesn't have to build it all in, that, but, but in a certain sense it's built in, in the, by which I mean that there is this dependency on the environment being in a certain way, and if the environment isn't that way, then something else will happen. And I think that gives us a completely different picture of nature and nurture, and it really does mean that everything is much more intertwined uh, than we used to think when we talked about genes for this and that behavior. It came as a surprise to me and probably to many other people to be told that at least in mammals, there are no genes for neurons. I thought, well, how could you know that you're supposed to be a Purkinje cell or a stellite cell or a basket cell unless there were genes for those? But at least there should be genes for neurons. It turns out not so. It turns out that what there are, of course, are genes for precursor cells, which given a particular chemical milieu will become a Purkinje cell or will become a stellate cell and so forth. And once you see that, it gives you a completely different sense of how to use the word hardwired, how to use the word predisposed or determined, and so forth. And I think that's all I want, really want to say about that. But given that Mother Nature has decided to build cascades of regulatory genes and to take advantage of regularities in the uh, epigenetic milieu, it turns out that learning is really a very cheap way to improve both motor control and predictive capacities. You can rely on the existence of certain regularities in nature to alter the neurons which alter the gene expression which alter the neurons even more. And so learning is a very, very deep and very, in a way, terribly clever way uh, to manage to increase your predictive capacities.